You're listening to Islam for Life with Sheikh Walid Mus'ad. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Hub Global. You can subscribe to this podcast and all of our other podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, or on our website, seekershub.fm. Visit seekershub.org for free online courses, our reliable answer service, and engaging media. So if, uh, just to recap briefly from what we started yesterday, we're reading from the book called Manazil As-Sa'ireen, or The Stations of the Wayfarers. This is one of the essential books in the science of Ilm al-Suluk, uh, or spiritual wayfaring, which is, I think, a unique, somewhat unique discipline to the Islamic tradition. And... In this particular discipline, we learn about how to overcome and uh, move beyond the obstacles of our human limitations uh, as they were to have a closer relationship with the divine, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they use the metaphor of the journey. So the salik or the sa'ir, sometimes used, means the one who is making a path. So the salik is the one forging a path. The sa'ir is the one moving. So he uses the word here, as sa'irin. Uh, so moving towards what? You know, when you move, you have an origin and you have a destination. So um, in, in essence, the destination is the origin. In other words, to, to, uh, to go back to what we were meant to be uh, when we were just pure souls before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which we were turned to be when we enter into the next life, and so the interim, which is this life, then is to just have a greater certainty, yaqeen, realization uh, that that's actually how it is, and then to live our lives according to, to that uh, haqiqah, according to that singular reality, and what that entails with uh, our relationships, our ethics, our ritual worship, uh, all of those things obviously are going to be affected by us um, being able to, uh, to affect that reality within ourselves. And so some of the ulama, scholars of Islam, uh, based upon the Qur'an, obviously, and the Sunnah, have described um, some of the points along the journey. So, you know, if I was going to, if you were to drive all the way to Vancouver from here, I'd have to tell you, you know, get out of Ontario, and then head up towards uh, west, towards what, Ottawa, and right, it's more or less, uh, not very good Canadian geography, but, and move, and move west, and you'll hit certain highways uh, until you get to the other coast, and, you know, if you want to stop, uh, you may see this particular rest stop, you may encounter these particular people, and so forth, so they've kind of describing that uh, path of uh, piety, you know, someone has taken a committed path and saying, I want to be the best version of myself, and usually that's not an overnight thing. Usually it's a process, and, and we're all, all of us, every single one of us is a work in progress. And he's just trying to uh, hear Imam al-Harawi, originally from uh, Afghanistan, from the city of Herat, is trying to help us kind of move along that path and tell us what it looks like, so that when we get there, we recognize it. So I had originally covered, I believe, um, at least some of the first ten chapters. So the way he divides the book is ten sections, uh, and in each section there are ten maqams, or ten stations. So there are a hundred total. The first one is called Bab al or the, the, the chapter of awakening, which means realizing that, hey, you know, it's actually possible to skate, skate through life and be kind of asleep and, and not really realize. And even though you seem like you're a committed Muslim, but you're kind of just living uh, the routine and the ritual rather than the spiritual, as it were. So, yaqada means the awakening. The last chapter, called Bab al um sounds like that should be one of the first, right? Because Tawheed, we think, that's, you know, saying la ilaha illallah, and that seems like the most basic thing. But as some of the great imams have said, 
من أشرقت بدايته أشرقت نهايته whoever's beginning is illuminated and their ending will be illuminated so even though Tawheed sounds simple it's not just what we say but it's actually living the meaning of لا إله إلا الله right and all that encompasses so there's a, a negation لا إله then there's a affirmation إلا الله and so our life is going to be about negating and avoiding certain things and it's also going to be about affirming and doing certain things so it, it ends up with the Tawheed uh, and then all the steps in between so the first 10 chapters more or less are looking at the what's called the Bidayat or the beginning beginnings and the beginning obstacles usually take the form of um, this relationship with our deeds right many people who become uh, newly committed to Islam or newly committed newly pious after kind of getting on that path a little bit uh, there are some pitfalls they need to watch out for and amongst those pitfalls is kind of feeling this sense of, of self-righteousness or, or superiority to others because you see what your deeds look like and then you're looking at other people and you say well they're not quite as good you know I must be in a better position and also since I'm doing these things for God for Allah then I think probably he's going to reward me and then an expectation builds about that and then that expectation grows into a feeling of entitlement or deservedness I actually deserve these good things to happen to me so these are things that can really um, stop you or at least hinder you on your path so Il Bidayat talks about Al Ikhlas Fil Amal talks about sincerity right or working towards sincerity in our deeds which is going to be the key for the acceptance of our deeds the second uh, set of ten chapters called Al Abwab or the gateways right and it's telling us well if you really want to go about purifying your uh, deeds it's going to be about purifying your intentions and about purifying the states that lead to the performance of deeds so that there's a way f for us to actually deal with our internal states sometimes called emotions right uh, in a way that now we can we can channel that very positively into being much better people than we are right now so we started reading from that th those second set uh, second uh, set of chapters and we had gone over the um, first four I think as Sidi Amr mentioned namely Bab al Huzn or the chapter of grief and then Al Khawf fear and then we did Al Ishfaq which I translated as sort of compassion um, mixed with concern and we did Al Khushua which is reverence and now uh, we're up to the chapter that's called Bab al ikhbat and these all sound similar but they all have kind of the the, uh, the characteristic of um, recognition of the Jalali aspect, Jalali attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognition that Allah is magnificent and that in the face of that magnificence uh, we should feel a sense of reverence, a sense of awe, even a sense of fear um, and obviously a sense of humility and these are all meanings that he's gonna, that he elaborates on so we're up to Bab al-Ikhbat right, which is, the, this word is actually only mentioned one, once in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Hajj and that's how he starts off this chapter where he says uh, Rahimahullah, Qalallahu Azza wa Jal وَبَشِّرِ الْمُخْبِتِينَ right, and give good tidings or uh, good news to those who are muhbit. Here he translates as those who humble themselves, right? Um, but we will see by the definition of, of the Imam himself that it's not just a humbling, but it's something beyond that. So he says, Al Ikhbatu min awa'il maqam at tuma'nina, wa wa wurud al ma'men min al ruju'a wa taraddudi, wa wa ala thalath darajat. So he says, the ikhbat, and I prefer like to just say the word rather than his translation because the meaning of it will come through, is one of the precursors or the beginnings of the state of tuma'nina or of serenity. And tuma'nina is another very powerful and important word, 
also comes up in the Quran, right? أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنْ الْقُلُوبِ By the remembrance of Allah, the qulub, the hearts, become this thing called mutma'in, or have tuma'nina. The Prophet ﷺ in one of the hadith in Bukhari, uh, he saw a man uh, praying. First the man came in, he gave salams to the Prophet ﷺ, then he prayed, and then he gave, gave him salams again, and the Prophet ﷺ told him, إِرْجِعَ فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَلِّ Go back because you haven't prayed properly. So the man goes and he prays once more. And he comes back, gives salam to the Prophet and he says, Irja fin tusalli. You're still not doing it quite right. Does it a second time? Comes back, gives salam to the Prophet Irja fin tusalli. So he does it a third time, comes back, and then when the Prophet repeats the same thing to him, go back, you haven't prayed correctly, he said, Ya Rasulullah inni la ahsinu ghayra. Fa'allimni. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't know how to do anything about it besides this, so teach me. Show me how to do it. And then he instructs him, and the, the word that the shahid, or what I'm going to, what I'm, the important part for our discussion here is, he says, when you stand, right, and then you go into ruku'ah, then stay there, hatta tatma'inna raqi'an. Thumma arfa'a hatta tatma'inna qa'iman. Thumma ashud hatta tatma'inna sajidan wa hakada. Or kama qal, sallallahu alayhi wa So when you go to pray, then stand until you're still. And when you go down to the ruku'ah position, the bowing position, then stay there till you reach this thing called hatta tatma'in, till you are in this state of tuma'nina. So tuma'nina then means there is a stillness, right? Because that's what it means in, in, in the verse, in the hadith, in terms of prayer. And that's actually one of the integrals of prayer, that you have at least a moment of stillness and that your prayer is not a you know, if someone is looking at you, that it doesn't look like it's a singular motion, you know, like up and like a wave. But you stand, you make rukuah, he stopped, back up, stop, sujood, stop, and so forth. So, this tuma'nina, there's a physical one, but there's also a tuma'nina of the heart. Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'in al By the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is this tuma'nina, this serenity, stillness, tranquility, let's say. Uh, of the heart and that comes by the dhikr of Allah that means that perhaps the default state of the heart is not tuma'nina or for many it's not tuma'nina so the opposite of that would be ittirab right would be oscillation right Some, the Quran describes the munafiqeen as what mudhabdhabina bayna dhalik la ilaha ula wa la ilaha ula right mudhabdhab and dhab dhaba, right, even in modern medicine, the Arabic translation of heartbeat is dhab dhaba, right? So it means just it's beating back and forth, but it's not still. Right? It doesn't have the tuma'nina. So tuma'nina then means stillness. In other words, the ability to be still even in the face of what seems like outside, exterior, uh, would be something to cause you trepidation or anxiety. Or anxiousness. And what is the remedy for that? In the verse, it's describing not the maqam of Tuma'nina, I believe, but the hal, at least initially. So it means if you are in a state of trepidation, if you go to the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will find a relief from that which you were, um, you were feeling uh, anxious about. Right? It's, it's most people, when uh, they, they get some difficult news or they lose a loved one, oftentimes they will say, well, let's pray, uh, you know, put the Qur'an in the background, or let's read some Qur'an and let's do some dhikr, let's do this, because they feel that there's a sense of, you know, putting them still or calming them or, and reminding them and so forth. So that may be like a temporary state. What he's talking about here, min bab al-ikhbat, Right, and he says, Min awa'il maqamat al tuma'nina, right, tuma'nina as a maqam, right, that's different. That means that whatever's going on outside, whatever news that you get, you greet it with ridha, right, you greet it with, with contentment, knowing that it's come from your Lord. And so it will not shake you in the sense that it will shake your certainty in your Lord. So people who are at that particular maqam, they're not shaken by external news. 
the the woman um, you know who, who who lost her father and her husband and her brother and I think another joy and uh, her son so all of the the closest male relatives that she have in one of the Ghazawat uh, of the Prophet right and the Prophet is on his way back and he has to tell her you know that she's lost her father her brother her son uh, you know or, or two sons um, but when they come back and they tell her we have you know stushid and they got the shahada she said what about Rasulullah it's like she didn't hear that particular part that khabar about her whole family basically um, but she, she wants to know about Rasulullah and they said no he's fine alhamdulillah he, he's okay he's fine she's like no I want to see him I have to see him let me see him right so perhaps you know uh, like Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam when he said to Allah أَلِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى قَالَ لَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَنَا وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي right when he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran show me how you give life to death how you bring life أَلِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى كَيْف I know you are the one who gives life Right? And you are the one who takes away life. But I want this to Madina. Right? He said, Awalam tu'min. Why? Do you don't believe, Ya Ibrahim? So that I can have this to Madina of the heart. Right? So he's saying this particular chapter is the beginning of the baqamat that have to Madina about them. Where there's no more trepidation, there's no more anxiety. And your certainty in your Lord, right, remains steadfast, if not increasing. Awa'il maqamat tuma'nina. This ikhbat. So then he's going to describe it to us. So there's another verse actually. Wa akhbatu ila rabbihim. That's also in, in the Quran, besides in Mukhbitin, Surah Hud. And um, so the ikhbat then is a sukun in Allah Ta'ala, as the commentator says. It is stillness towards or with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Right? Like the verse says, وَأَخْبَتُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ There is a stillness, a serenity, because even though everything outside doesn't seem still and serene, but Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is samad, uh, uh, the immutable, the unchangeable, Everything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, if you really think about it, should instill within you serenity, right, and stillness. Because there's nothing that is out of order from the perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything exactly the way it should be. It's just from our limited understanding that we, we fail to see that. So, um, he says it's three levels. Ala thalath darajat. darajat al-ula. Oh, sorry, there's a part we didn't explain here. So, al akhbat min awa'il maqam et wa'mina wa wurud al ma'man min al ruju'a wa taraddud. Right? It is, as we said, the first maqam of the stillness, and it, it is the inception of assuredness or safeguarding from two things ruju'a and taraddud. And these two things actually get in the way a lot, hinder our way. So rujua would be reversal and taraddud would be unsuredness, hesitation. So rujua to what? Well, once someone starts to try to be on a committed path, um, what they were before is never too far away. And so sometimes you will be tempted to go back to that was before. Because what's ahead is still a little bit unknown. And most people prefer the familiar to the unknown. And um, so they'll say, uh, you know, maybe this is too extreme or this is too much. Or let me just be the way that I was. Let me go back. And sometimes that will en encompass within it mukhalafat, will encompass within it, you know, doing the bad habits that we used to do and so forth. Because it's familiar. Or as they say today, it's the comfort zone. This whole book is about getting out of your comfort zone. 
So if you're not into leaving your comfort zone, this is not for you. But if you're ready to leave your comfort zone, then this is kind of the blueprint about a little bit how, how to go towards it. أَمَّا التَّرَدُّدْ Right, which is hesitation, which means, um, as he says here, let me just get it right. Having doubts, you know, about is this the right thing that I'm doing? Or, you know, can I really aspire to be something different? Or am I just sort of you know, socially, uh, you know, living a socially deterministic life and I'm just going to be a product of my environment and of my upbringing and who my parents are and all these things and so maybe I shouldn't really think about, you know, what the teacher was talking about and these realizations, all of that sounds like very nice and pretty but, you know, I'm just an average person and, you know, I don't have all of that and so forth. So this is hesitation back and forth because it's, it's sowing doubt within you. Um, and the way to encounter that doubt, all of this are nafsaniyat, right? All of these are going back to the doubt that's within uh, the ego, within the self, because the self is, going to t- is the one who's going to tell you, no, you can't do this, just you know, take, relax, take it easy, it's too much, Allah didn't ask you to do this, you can just do your five prayers and you'll be fine, and all of these justifications, this internal struggle that you have with yourself. Um, so when you turn it over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? أَخْبَتُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ سُكُون إِلَى اللَّهِ You will never have sukun with your nafs. You're never going to be contented, nor should you be, with this, with your nafs. But your contentment will be by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not with you. So the more you continue to look for that in, within yourself, you're not going to find it. But if you turn it over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, and be content in that which he has contented for you, then that's where you're going to find it. So the three levels, as he says here, al thath darajat, darajat al-ula, an tastaghriq al-ismatu al-shahwa. An tastaghriq, the first aspect of that, al-ismatu al-shahwa. The first level is having, uh, here isma, it doesn't mean ismat al-anbiya, because that's only for the prophets. In other words, it doesn't mean infallibility, even though it's translated sometimes like that. But it means hivd, you know, to be preserved more or less from, from sin. So then this overcomes the shahwa. This overcomes the lower and passionate desires. That's one of the signs then, or, or of the first level, of this ikhbat. That your, your isma, your virtuousness, um, are too much in the face of whatever shahawat, whatever lazat, whatever lower passions and desires that you, that you seek out. You know, Sayyidina Umar, it's reported that he once said that, um, you know, as for a shahwa towards women, I no longer have that. I stay married and I give them the right and so forth, but I don't, I don't feel the need for that. It's not something that, you know, drives me. And... Uh, that's possible to have not just in, in, in sexual desire, but in, in all types of desires. In desire for food, in, and even in what we call the, the, uh, the intellectual desires, the desire to be the leader, the desire to be known, the desire to be famous, the desire uh, to have status and prestige, and people say nice things about you, and people praise you, and so forth. These are all desires too. These are all min alam shahawat And when one's virtuousness, right, They're, they are now preserved because of their struggle on the path, they will sense it is much easier. They don't have those desires anymore. They see them for what they are. They're vacuous, they're empty, they have no meaning, they don't really bring anything to you at all. And, you know, we talked about this, uh, I think, the other night or the other day, that people who reach and have everything that everyone else thinks that they ought to have, right? Like a lot of these famous people that we hear about now who are committing suicide. When they reach a point and they have all of the things that what, you know, people who are the average person is striving their whole life to have, you know, fancy house, fancy car, praise, celebrity, all that type of thing, they, they achieved all of that. Then, and this is them saying in interviews, 
They said, once we actually got there, we realized it's nothing. That it's not what we thought it would be. It's not the fulfillment that we thought it was going to turn into. In fact, it left, it left us feeling quite empty. Because once you achieve what you think is the most important thing to achieve, then what do you do after that? And if you don't have an answer for that, then why would you want to continue? Right? So I, I feel a sense of compassion for these people, Ani Yishvalk, that from their perspective, why would they want to continue? What's left to do? Right? Because they've gotten all the things that everybody else wants. And everybody else, you know, makes movies about and, and television and art and culture and all centers around those things that people want to achieve. And then you achieve them. Now what? And for us, uh, the thing that we want, right, is still yet ahead. And it, we realize that it's not going to be realized in this life, right, and that, you know, making the most of every precious second and moment that we have is really the thing that we want to do. We want to give the time its right, its haq, and use it in the best way and, and please our Lord. And that's something of the akhirah. Right? You can say that people can have a desire for the akhirah and people can have desire for the dunya. Minkum man yuridu dunya wa minkum man yuridu akhirah. That's what the Quran says. But the thing about the dunya is it will always make you more thirsty. It doesn't quench your thirst. Because the more you have of it, then the more you feel that you're parched. Right? It's like drinking something like salt water. Like it just makes you thirstier. Whereas the more of the akhirah, you still desire more of it, but at the same time, you are sensing that with each successive you know, step that you're taking there, you are getting that sense of fulfillment and you continue it, it encourages you, you want to continue, and so forth. So, um, you know, it is possible to overcome what we think to be these insurmountable, you know, obstacles, internal obstacles that we have of desires and things like this. But it does take a path of, of mujahada, it does take a path of struggle. Uh, and it does mean that you say no to yourself more often than you say yes, at least in the beginning. And it's hard to say no to yourself. It's easier to say yes. Um, that's why they saw that time, if you learn to manage it well, right, by filling it with things that will keep you busy with the good, then it will keep you away from things that will keep you busy with the bad. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he very famously said, نَفْسُكَ إِلَّمْ تَشْغَلْهَا بِالْخَيْرِ شَغَلَكَ بِالشَّرِ Your nafs, if you don't keep it busy with good, it's going to keep you busy with evil. وَالْوَقْتُ سَيْفْ إِمَّا تَقْطَعْ بِهِ أَوْ يَقْطَعُكَ And time is like the sword. Either you cut with it, you're purposeful and you're deliberate in how you use your time, أَوْ يَقْطَعُكَ Or it cuts you. Then it's the one that has a handle on you and it's cutting you because your time just goes. Right? We have words in, in, in the Western languages like pass time. How to pass the time, right? What do they say about baseball? America's favorite pastime. Just pass the time. Right? As if the time was something that was so cheap and so little value that we just need to pass it. Oh, we got a few minutes. Let's kill some time. What should we do? We got some time to kill. And you are killing the time because you're killing yourself. So the time is the most precious commodity that you have because once it's gone, you can't, re you can't re retrieve it. There's no making up. So it is possible to overcome one shahawat, one ladat, and one of the signs of that is you'll feel this stillness, this serenity in the face of what used to be um, the, the problem with your, with your lower desires. So, تستغلق الاسمة الشهوة وتستدرك الإرادة الغفلة An irada here, resolve, overcoming, Remissness or carelessness, ghafla. So you have a steadier supply of irada, a steadier supply of resolve, rather than having these short spurts where you feel like doing it and then the feeling goes away and you say, okay, let me just go back to whatever I was doing. But one of the signs of tawfiq, 
one of the signs of success is that you feel like, you know, your, your battery is, uh, is getting charged, you know, it's getting recharged and it's not running out. And you have a sense that you're resolved that this is what I'm going to do, right? This is the path I'm going to take. And that will counter any semblance of ghafla, right? You're not going to be back and forth. Because remember, this is the maqam, the beginning of stillness. All of the ones before it, there was like an oscillation, a back and forth, you know, between um, feeling the sense of resolve and then feeling a sense of carelessness, between feeling hopeful and then feeling a little bit more fearful. But now we're getting to the beginning steps of sukun, of tuma'nina, right? Tuma'nina til maqam, of the station of tuma'nina, not just fleeting glimpses of it. Yes, the two weeks that you spent in Umrah or in Hajj, you felt it. And it was real. We're not saying it wasn't real. Alhamdulillah. But then when you come back, and you said, how, why did that go away? Right? And how come that I don't feel the same? And you notice people who come back, especially the first time, they, you know, they, wa- they want to play the, the same imam who reads in the haram to remind themselves of that. They want to dress the same way. They'll keep dressing the white, you know, jalabiyya and stuff uh, for a while afterwards. And... And they're trying to hold on to the memory of what that was. But sooner or later, maybe a week, maybe two, maybe three, maybe a month, it's no longer there anymore. And you move on and you're back to your old routine and then you, then you feel a little bit of, of, of loss. And then you say, okay, then we just have to keep going a lot, right? And well, that's not wrong. It's good you know, to have that intention. But you're, you're running after like the, you know, the fleeting spiritual high rather than trying to establish within yourself the maqam of tuma'nina, which is going to take a little bit of harder work to do than just buying an umrah ticket and going over there and then back and forth and so forth. Uh, even though we do need to have these kind of periodic respites from our, our, our everyday routine, like Ramadan is one of them, obviously, and we need to have those every once in a while, but they are wasail. They are means to an end. They're not the ends. Right? You can't make your whole life like that, uh, just a steady stream of that, but it's there as anchor points for you to build from that point on. And the last, in terms of the, the first level, so here he says by talab, or seeking, it means seeking by way of love, by way of mahabba. Not, not like the second one, by way of resolve. No, this is here by way of mahabba. Um, why? Because salwa also means, like from tasalli, it means comfort zone. It means being okay and comfortable with where you are. But your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your love of journeying towards Him will propel you over that. So you have the three things in, in this particular level. You have um, you have the virtue or the isma, you have the irada or the resolve, and then you have the talab or the love or the mahabba. So now your emotions, as I said earlier, are being funneled and channeled into something that is going to take you to a better place, into a, a higher place. Rather than being funneled and being used and utilized towards achieving um, the fleeting desires of this world, the fleeting satisfactions. So all of us can love, all of us can have resolve, um, all of us can be um, you know, determined to do something, but what that thing we, is, we are going to be determined about or the thing that we're going to love is going to be an effect of, of our internal state. So some people don't, ha- don't even know that you can love something beyond the satisfaction of self. And all they know is self-satisfaction. They've never tasted anything besides that. So they think that's the pinnacle. Just accumulate as much as I can and and acquire as much as I can. And then that will be the road to self-satisfaction, which is to them is the the maqam that they want to reach. And they don't know anything besides that because they've never tasted something besides that. And as I said, when you actually reach it, in that dunyawi sense, you find that it's a sarab, it's a mirage, it's nothing. It actually was never existed to begin with. And the only true thing is seeking towards the Mawla Azza wa Jalla, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَهَذِي دَرَجَةُ الْأُولَى 
بِدَرَجَةُ الثَّانِيَةِ Second level after this. أَلَّا يَنْقُصُ إِرَادَتُهُ السَّبَبُ وَلَا يُوحِشُ قَلْبَهُ عَارِضُ وَلَا تَقْتَعُ طَرِيقَ عَلَيْهِ فِتْنَةِ So three things also. The second level consists in not having any cause. يَنْقُصُ إِرَادَتُهُ السَّبَبُ uh, to take away from one's resolve, right? In other words, we talked about this, and I think in the previous maqam in khawf, not to have uh, the intermediary, secondary causes, right? Which are everything that Allah uses to affect everything in the world. Mistake them as independent agents and can do things by themselves, so that it will then impugn your resolve, your irada. So, if for example, um, you say, yeah, I, I want to achieve this thing, but um, I have these bills to pay, and I have, uh, uh, the, you know, the kids, I have to put them through school, and I have to do all of these things, so I don't really have time to think about this stuff that you're talking about here. So you be become majgul, you become busy with all of these intermediary causes, and so it, it takes away from your resolve. But when you're at the level of ikhbat, this, the second level of ikhbat, it doesn't take away your resolve. Life goes on. You know, we shouldn't have this um, uh, incorrect sort of uh, uh, romantic idea that, you know, when we, have, when we grow in knowledge of Allah and grow in our deen and in piety, then the road is going to be quite easy. And that all of the things that everybody else suffers in terms of family relationships and difficulties and problems at work and so forth, all those go away. They don't actually go away. They stay around. But your ability to deal with them and how you go about working through them will change. And they will not affect you in the same way that they affected you before. So don't have the expect expectation that they're just going to go away. You know, I've met people of Allah and they have all the same issues that we all have. It's not like, you know, they don't have kids and they don't worry about them. and They have all those things and they have... Uh, family disputes and, and so forth and, and the, but at the same time they still they're resolved right it doesn't it doesn't slow them down they still move on فَذِي وَحْدَ وَلَا يُحِشُ قَلْبُهُ عَارِضُ right and their heart is not going to be alienated by a arid. we said the arid before uh, is any incident anything that comes along the way Right? It could be a thought, it could be something somebody said to you, it could be an event, whatever it might be, it's not going to cause this wahsha, this alienation in your heart. Right? You're not going to feel like, oh, here, here's a setback. You won't see your circumstances as setbacks. They're not setbacks. Right? You can have, you can be increasing internally and outside you may what seem to be setbacks, but they're not really setbacks. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, just look at his life. You could say that he had what appeared to be setbacks. Certainly Ta'if, when he went to Ta'if and they rejected him and, and he had to leave town in a rush, it seems like a setback outwardly. right? But this was just Allah SWT preparing him for something that no other human being ever went through or will ever go through again in this life. Al-Isra' wal maraj which was just a few months if not weeks after that and that where he <coughs> went in one night on the night journey from, from Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis and then Ila Bayt al-Izza to you know uh, Ibn Abbas said that he actually saw his Lord in a, in a manner commensurate with Allah's majesty and just a few months or a few weeks before that young kids were taking rocks and throwing them at the feet of the Prophet ﷺ. how can you compare those two things it makes it seem really small right it's nothing but it was just a precursor or a preparation. So we can have all of these what seem to be like setbacks, but it shouldn't impugn right, our irada, nor should it alienate us in terms of feeling the sense of wahsha or the sense of you know, divide between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَقْتَعُ الطَّرِيقُ عَلَيْهِ فِتْنَةً Right? Fitan. Fitna means trial, means tribulation. Um, People of Allah are not immune from trials and tribulation. And have taqwa, have fear of the fitna that does not merely affect only those who have committed wrong amongst you. 
That means those who have committed wrong and those who have not committed wrong can be affected by the fitna, right? And they say, الْفِتْنَةَ تَعُمْ The fitna, when it happens, when a trial and tribulation happens, it's general. It can affect many, many people who are not even party to the original uh, circumstances that led to it. But they may be brought into it, right? They may be dragged into it. They may be unwilling participants, whatever way. So even that, right, is not going to It's not going to hinder you on your journey, on your path, right? All of these things at the end of the day are still coming from the same source, coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why should they stop me on my way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? الدرجة الثالثة, the third level, the highest level, أن يستوي عنده المدح والذم وتدوم لائمته لنفسه ويعمى عن نقصان الخلق عن درجته. So the first part, أن يستوي عنده المدح والذم. So this is one of the signs here of how we deal with people around us, where he says that whether people praise you or disparage you are the same. And this is what we call indifference. You're indifferent. They praise me, they don't praise me. They think I'm great, they don't think I'm great. Yastawi, uh, it's the same, right? In other words, it's meaningless. Because their praise or their censure uh, doesn't mean anything if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's upset with me or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is pleased with me. He is the one whose pleasure that I am seeking. Right? And we know that kind of, as I said earlier, in an intellectual sense, but to, to live it. To actually, in the face of it, someone like criticizes you fiercely, maybe to your face, are you shaken or are you not shaken? Right? Do you feel like, you know, a very upset? Do you want to get back at that person because they did that to you? Or are you like, Jazakallah khair, karamakallah, it's a good, good opinion that you have, I'll, I'll work on that, that type of thing. And, and are you still yani, serene and, you know, still in, in the face of that type of thing? And that's an internal state. It's not actually what you say to the person, or what you, but it's how you feel inside. وَتَدُومْ لَإِمَتُهُ لِنَفْسِهِ And the reproach of your ego remains constant. In other words, you know that your ego is an enemy, your nafs is an enemy, and you don't lose sight of that. Because even in the higher maqams, it could still play tricks with you. right? One of the ways is via bab al you know, of you being self-pleased and saying, Oh, look how good I am. I know that my ego is affecting me. But the fact that I know that means I'm in you know, one of these higher places because I can see that. right? So it can play tricks in this way. That's why the last part he says, Which means that you become blind to people who may be of a lesser uh, uh, rank than you in terms of their spiritual state. You don't actually see that in them. You see them as better than you. So you're blind to their, their naqais. You're blind to their shortcomings. Not that you trying to have a good opinion of them despite what you see in front of you. That's not what it's saying. This is better. This is higher. It's saying that you actually don't see their shortcomings. You see only the good in them. right? And you see that whatever might be of a shortcoming is something that you know, is not of their doing. It's their nafs. It's their shaitan. They're having a little bit of a challenge, but it's not who they are. Right? You don't identify that. You learn to separate what they do in their deeds from who that person is, and that's makhluq lillah. Right? That's a created being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who had a makhluq muhtaram. Right? This is something that should be respected and is inviolable and has a hurma and, and all of those things, and you don't violate that, and you don't see that you're above them at all. Hadi Min al ikhbat So, um, we have about five minutes left. I think I'll stop here. We'll break for, for Asr. And then we'll come back after that and, and read the next chapter, Bab uh, al-Zuhd, or Renunciation, inshaAllah. Thank you for listening to Islam for Life with Sheikh Walid Mus'ad. If you like this podcast, we'd appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and Google Play. Help Seekers Hub spread the light of guidance to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.